Okay, I got it. Hi, everybody. Yeah, another winter, another series from Hardy Plant Society. It's good to have everyone back. Um, and we're super, we're finally getting really organized on this virtual series. We're keeping them to January and February, uh, the doldrums months, as it were. And I hope you didn't get too much snow. Um, we have um, a lot to offer this year. Uh, just a reminder, if you haven't checked, we have uh, a very exciting lineup for our virtual series. And we're trying something new. And you can share this with your non-hardy plant friends, although I, we hope you persuade them to join us. Um, the virtual Wednesdays will be open for a fee to the general public. Um, don't worry, we've expanded our Zoom account, so there will always be room for our membership, all right? Um, this is a reminder that we have a lot happening in January, and we're hoping that you keep checking our online events calendar often. Uh, there's still time to register for the uh, Walkovic and Schumacher Memorial Lecture in, um, on January 21st. This is our annual lecture that we co-sponsor with Scott Arboretum. For those who are paying attention, notice that we have added a name to the title of this lecture. Um, when Joanne Walkovic uh, started this organization, she was also working with a friend, Jean Schumacher, who sadly passed away in 2023. And since these two individuals together founded the organization, we felt that we should honor both of them. Uh, we are pleased that in this, the first official Walkovic and Schumacher lecture, that we have Paul Tukey. Uh, Paul's coming from the Glenstone Museum in Potomac, Maryland, and he's a recipient of the prestigious Communicator of the Year Award from the American Horticultural Society, so he should be terrific for us. He's also the Green Medal Award winner from Garden Writers of America. So if you go online and you click on the links, you'll get registered for this event. Um, our seed exchange is open. This is the 30th year, can you believe? So if you've never ordered from us before, there's still time. It's really magical to see the seeds uh, coming up. So please be sure to um, put in your orders. The deadline for getting orders in is by the end of January, on January 24th. Uh, we have opened the grants uh, program for 2024. And as you can see, the deadline fast approaches for that as well it is January 31st. If you know of uh, an organization that could use a little support, we encourage you to encourage them to apply because Hardy Plant is committed to supporting the greater community in uh, gardening and greening this world. Our annual March into Spring, we're super excited this year we are going to be at Winterthur. Um, as you can see, there's still plenty of time. Oops, oops, jumped. All right, there's still plenty of time to uh, register at the early bird rate. It's $90 for members. Um, if you know non-members who would like to come, you can see that everybody's welcome, but again, encourage them to join us because then they get the lower rate. Uh -huh. <clears throat> These are our speakers. We're super, super excited. We have Mike Rauch. Uh, he's going to be speaking uh, on invasive insects. We have uh, a number, Paul Spriggs from the Rock Gardening World. Um, he's going to show us in depth the huge projects he does. Our speaker today is going to, in fact, be at Winterthur because this is a hero of his. We have Uli Lorimar coming down from the Garden in the Woods, those who were on the tour to New England. Um, he can, he's going to obviously speak about native plants since that's their strength. And finally, and this one is really cool. If you've read the New York Times, Janet and Jeff Crouch uh, beat the system. They worked with an HOA that initially did not want like their wilding project and working with the state of Maryland, they got the laws changed. So uh, they will speak to their journey to rewilding a property within an HOA organization. Uh, heck our calendar, oh my gosh, wow. We got a lot of pop-ups and workshops coming up uh, from a series uh, at 
at uh, David Culp's A Year at Brandywine Cottage, A Trip to New Jersey. We have coaxed Ken Drews into opening his garden for Hardy Plant. We have tons of private gardens. We have nurseries. We have shopping. We have trips. Boy, do we have trips. We are headed to all kinds of wonderful places in 2024. Uh, we're going to Washington, D.C. and Rhode Island. Rhode Island, by the way, I mean, Rhode Island filled up in 16 minutes. So you can get on the wait list, um, but it's going to be a very exciting tour. We're going to go to New York. No, we're not going to go to the New York Botanic Garden. We will be going to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden and the Untermeyer Garden, which is pictured in your bottom left corner, and a number of lesser known uh, gardens within the New York City area. We are also going to Sicily and Rome. So if you're interested in that trip, if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, our tour guide, Kevin, um, Kevin, whoops, hi, Kevin, um, Trevor has given us a program. You can watch it. We hope you decide you want to join us. And, uh, right, suddenly it's frozen. Yikes, there we are. Mark your calendar. We've already got our member garden tour on the calendar. It's Saturday, June 29th, and we're going to Coatesville. I was about to say down to Coatesville and Kennett Square, because for those who don't know, I'm up near Princeton, New Jersey. But, you know, it's amazing how far a gardener will travel to see a garden. So I will be there and I hope to run into you on that tour. Finally, OK, I try and keep my part short. I'd like to introduce Kevin. He has spoken to us before. He's a terrific speaker and very knowledgeable guy. He's uh, uh, Kevin is a Penn State Extension, Dauphin County Master Gardener. His career as a family physician has taught him the importance of gardening, both for mental and physical well-being. He started his garden, really, 35 years ago? Holy moly, Kevin. Um, yeah. and, re and realized that developing a green thumb is all about persistence. Yeah, I've often said, you know, you're not a real gardener to have killed a thousand plants. He's won lots of blue ribbons. He's created tremendous habitat, all in his modest suburban garden. And with that, Kevin... I'm going to stop share and let you take over. Great, Nora. Thank you so much. Let me get my screen. Ah. Oh, while there he's doing that, while he's doing yeah. that, be sure to put your questions in the chat box. And at the end of his presentation, I'll field them and we'll run all the questions by him. It's all yours, Kevin. Okay. Everything should be up, right? You can see me. Yep. Okay, super. Well, thanks again, Nora. Thanks so much for the intro. And I am so excited to be back and part of the Tuesday at 10 webinars. So as some of you know, I live in Harrisburg and I'm a member of this chapter and have just been a passionate garden gardener really for the past you know 30 plus years. Well, I created my first crevice garden really about two years ago as part of a sloping bed that I had that existed in my front garden. And since then, I've helped a couple of others put together a crevice garden, and I'm gonna share kind of my experiences. So, you know, let's let's get going on this little journey here. So, well, this is really probably everyone's first experience with a, with a crevice garden. It might be a dandelion, or in this case, a verbena seedling, uh, but it's really all about microclimates. So we're gonna talk about, you know, really let's start with just defining it. So a crevice garden really is kind of a modern type of a rock garden. And it's more, you know, rock gardens have rocks scattered through, but crevice gardens tend to have more of the garden covered by stone. And typically that stone will then be placed vertically or on some type of a slant. While tight spacing is definitely often advised, it can be variable based on somebody's own uh, desires of their own design, but you definitely wanna consider how you're gonna put the plants in and maybe have planting pockets. But in general, you'll see that many of the stones will be about one to two inches apart. And that seems to work ideal for crevice garden. Drainage is absolutely the key. So these gardens work really well if they're already built on some type of a berm or a slope, uh, or you can actually build the garden from scratch and create that berm. So. 
but it's all about drainage. So here's a picture of a, of a rock garden on the left and a crevice garden on the right. And you can see it's really, you know, it's different aesthetics, but it's also different microclimates, uh, which really lets a crevice garden even expand further the range of plants that you can grow. I also find that crevice gardening is definitely less maintenance, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. So, you know, why create one? Well, first of all, four season interest. I, I think the garden looks great in the winter landscape. It's, uh, it, you know, it, it, sh it really shines, the, the rocks stand out. Uh, the, it, it adds some definite really cool features in the winter. Many of the plants are evergreen or semi-evergreen. So a lot of them still look good in the winter months. And then of course, once we get to spring, many crevice garden plants are alpine plants and most of them do bloom in spring. So spring becomes the big show. And then the rest of the year though, you get all these really interesting shadows uh, as the light moves across in summer and fall. And there are some other um, small plants that do well in crevice gardens that bloom at that time. Another thing is to, you know, create these, you know, um, oh, I, yeah, I mentioned to uh, landscape on a slope or a berm, uh, you know, and that would be instead of creating a, a retaining wall, why not have a crevice garden? Um, you'll also can create microclimates, which will vary based on the orientation that you, you kind of put the, the stones in. So mine run kind of north to south, which creates really great shadows in the morning and the evening. Some crevice gardens, if they're running east to west, you'll have less shadowing, but you'll have de more defined colder and warmer areas based on the way that, the, the again, the rocks are positioned. It's a great way to fill awkward corners, maybe around some steps or some weird angles in the garden. If you're not sure what else to plant there, a crevice garden is great. And as I mentioned, lower maintenance, the only thing I, you know, I ever use is just a leaf blower. So a couple quick examples. So this is at Whistley, and you can see that whole tight vertical stones. I mean, some of these crevices are, are just minute. Uh, so this one's really tightly packed. But one feature you can see on this picture that's important is it's good to site a crevice garden near some type of a path because many of these plants are going to be small alpines and they need to be viewed up, up close. So it is important if you are going to make one to have it near some type of path. Here's one at JC Ralston. I was just there last year and you can see just a, a very, a little different aesthetics. Uh, they, the crevices are, some are, are tight, some are wider. They have some loose gravel. You can see there's planting pockets. So there's lots of different ways to do this. And as we move on, I'm gonna talk about, you know, what the guidelines are out there for what generally works, but keep in mind, these are not hard and fast rules. I think the crevice garden has to become part of the overall landscape and it has to have a sense of place. So it has to fit in and that's kind of important as well. Well, a super brief history, you know, the development of this style came out of Czechoslovakia, pretty much around Prague in the 1980s. And it was really driven by their desire to grow some really rare Campanulas and Daphnes uh, that were just, they just couldn't keep alive in traditional gardens and they figured out how to do this. Joseph Halda is considered the father of crevice garden uh, gardening and his peers made some modifications. They created that vertical style and then they came to North America giving seminars and creating gardens. And of course, influenced a couple of young rock gardeners named Kenton Seth from Colorado and Paul Spriggs from British Columbia who are really kind of carrying the mantle and innovating this garden style for North American gardens. And of course, we're gonna be fortunate, as Nora mentioned, that we'll have Paul Spriggs as a speaker at March into spring. Um, I've heard Paul before, and um, he's just uh, he's just amazing. He's a great speaker. He does super, uh, you'll, you'll just love it, love his talks. Uh, I, he's he's going to cover this topic, obviously, super thoroughly, and I know he'll be showing you a lot of the bigger projects that he works on. So I'm really excited to getting down there. Um, so how does this really work? So this is a kind of a diagram of a typical cross section of a crevice garden. And the way this works is it sheds water because of the slopes. 
And that's why it's important that this is on some type of slope or berm. So you have that initial surface drainage, but then you get drainage between the crevices and the plant's roots are going to actually seek the depth to get through the substrate down to the soil. So a lot of them will root out down really, really deep, but you'll see that a number of roots will actually hug the rocks themselves and will wrap around them because the rocks will actually maintain uh, kind of a coolness and they also maintain water against the rock surfaces. So it's a great place. The roots get this consistent moisture and temperature and the crowns stay warm and dry. So we're really creating like mini mountains and it leaves us with kind of dry crowns in the wet season and moist roots in the dry season. Well, as I mentioned, site selection is important. This photo is from 2019, and this is when I started to think about redesigning this spot. Uh, it looked like a great spot, um, and I started thinking about putting a crevice garden here. This was an area in my front yard that is already on a slope, and I wanted to, uh, I was using it as a display garden, so I would change it up every year. So I would have different, first different bulb displays here, then I'd have different annuals put in here. And I really decided to move that display garden into my, into the hell strip between the sidewalk and the curb. So that opened this up and I wanted this to be a little more permanent display. And I thought a crevice garden would be perfect here. So when you're thinking about it, you definitely need to think about sun or shade. And to be honest, I think sun is easier. There's a lot more plant possibilities for crevice gardens in the sun. So I would lean that way. As I mentioned, uh, it works best on some type of a slope. And the way this garden area looks, you, it's hard to tell here, but it's actually a bit of a triangle. And the walkway to my front door is to the right. And the there's another path that's kind of in between some of these plants to the left. And it makes this kind of triangle shape. And so what, what I originally did is I built this on a little bit of a berm. So it slowly creeps up to where that sundial is. And then it kind of drops off a little bit more steeply. Now there's actually a path of grass right in front of where those petunias are. And that's the view, the place for viewing. As I mentioned, it's good to have. And what you don't really see is then there's still yet another bed and then I, the picture's taken from the sidewalk. So, but that's kind of the area I, I looked at. Um, another really important thing is to make sure that you really keep it away from any rhizomatous plants or significant tree roots, because if they grow up into the crevice garden from below, it's just gonna be a maintenance nightmare. And lastly, try not to put it over utility lines because if a project ever gets needs to get done, you know, these crevice gardens are definitely heavy and big and, and they will, you know, they're just tougher to take apart. So, uh, and also if there was some like piping underneath, it could crush, the weight could crush the pipes depending on the size. So stay away from utility lines if you can. My, my thoughts, which I think was important when I did this is, you know, start small and manageable. If you want to get going on this thing and, you know, try it in a container or a trough, that's a great place to test out a crevice garden or at least a small garden in your space. And that's what I did. You know, make sure it feels like it belongs. So, you know, I'm really just kind of in the foothills of where the, the, the I'm just to the south of the part of the Appalachian Mountains where my garden exists. I'm kind of in a little bit of rolling hills and I'm not far from a creek and the Susquehanna River. So, I, you know, it's a little bit more rolling. It's not quite as rugged, uh, but I definitely wanted to have lo some local stone. And, and that was important to make it feel like it belongs here. Also, keep in mind that change is inevitable. I think crevice gardens are potentially easy enough. You could, ex expanding is actually pretty easy. You could take it apart or readjust it if you need to. Uh, you probably don't, you don't necessarily want to, but it's definitely doable. And then, you know, make it your own. I, I mentioned follow the principles, but design what you like and absolutely make it express yourself. So here's about a little bit about constructing. So the picture on the left is not my garden, but it, it showed the point that I wanted to make. Um, on the right is my garden. And if you really look in the back of that picture in the middle at the top, you'll see that same place where I dug down. So you want to cut a footprint out and you want to cut down about four to six inches. And that's going to be to let the garden kind of meld into the the surroundings so you want to go four to six inches down and you actually take that soil and you just mound it up somewhere you know however you want to shape 
the middle, but you're just gonna go ahead and mound it up. So that's gonna actually increase the berm. So that's what you do with the soil. Now, if it's a brand new um, garden area, and if you're really in an area that has a lot of clay, you might wanna consider adding compost if, at this point, just to help improve the drainage. Mine was in an established bed. I didn't need any compost at all needed. So I just, I just cut the garden footprint and then what I did is then I you want to put at least four inches of coarse sand. So you just get builder sand and you're and four inches is minimum. You can go anywhere from four to 12 inches. I was using about four to five inches. I made this garden ended up being about six by 12 feet. So it wasn't super big, but but even at four to five inches, that was a little over 1200 pounds of sand. So uh, you do want to get the sand on. Now, there are a ton of recipes out there. And, and if you look, you'll see a million different recipes of what to make the crevice garden. But I did some research and I found that, you know, a lot of people were saying that if you get more than 25 inches of rain a year, which obviously is all of us, you know, then, you know, just putting sand over soil works. And, and you know, my garden's now been in place for two years and it's working really well. So here's, again, the, a little bit of me getting started. I'm kind of, lay, you know, at least playing around, laying a few of the stones. Uh, you can see I was starting to lay them on a little bit of an angle, as I mentioned. And what you're going to do is, for me, because this was within an existing bed that already was on a slope, I started at the top end. And I what I did is I then buried the perimeter stone because I want, I want this to look like it's coming out of the ground, not sitting on top of it. So you bury the perimeter edge. Then what I wanted to do is bring, I almost brought the garden, the, the, rock, the stones up a little bit to accentuate the hill and then bring them down the slope and then buried it at the lower end of the berm. So that everything again looked like it was going to, um, like it was there all along. So here's just another view. I used just Pennsylvania flagstone. I went to a stone yard where a lot of people had picked through and left a bunch of irregular pieces. And those were exactly what I wanted. And, and so I've also mixed in some small boulders. I mean, I've got this size boulders that I could handle kind of mixed in a lot of my other gardens. And I just like the, the look of the boulders with the, the vertical stones. And also some of the boulders themselves had kind of a, a flattened edge. And then I, I used them to kind of mimic the actual, to make some additional crevices. Now the, the flagstone is buried about 60 to 60% 60 or 70% of the stone is buried. And the boulders are at least 50 to 60% buried. So most of it, the key is the flagstones got to be buried so that they need to be big enough that you're going to have them a good 50, 60 percent, maybe even up to 70 percent buried. And what I would do is I just I took a hand trowel, I made a groove in the sand, I slid the rock in, I wiggled it, I used a rubber mallet, and then I just would replace the sand back. And I was doing this back and forth and back and forth, uh, and this kind of started to work. Um, here's just another picture of this a little bit in progress. Um, and I wanted to leave some planting pockets, so I did leave a few more gaps. I knew I wanted to put some succulents in here, and I took this apart many, many different times, adding stones. This isn't the final look, but um, I just kept sliding additional stones in. I, I Then sometimes I didn't like it, and I'd pull out four or five stones and then reposition them. So it's just kind of getting the pattern, and, and initially that's what you wanted to do, is kind of get the pattern in place. Eventually, I, I started to become satisfied with where I was. And then what I did is I added as a top dressing, like three eighth inch, I used just some Pennsylvania river stone and poultry grit. So the river stone, you just want some small stone, you want about two inches of top dressing. Ultimately, what you don't see here is I then took other flagstone and I broke that up into smaller chips and added that, scattered that into the top of the garden to make it look like the, the stone was breaking up. Uh, and also, um, I will say that in the photo, on these photos, the distances between the stones actually look wider than they actually are. Uh, my, the, the, the distances are about two inches, some about three, but this makes them look like really, really distant, but they're actually a little closer than they really are. You'll see that in other pictures. And then the poultry grit I liked because it gave a, a, just that gritty 
surface. It also added a little bit of color. Uh, the one that I got here, uh, it's just, it's granite and it's got a little pinkish color to it. So it added a little nice color to the to the garden. Now we're gonna talk about the planting process in a few minutes, but I just wanna show you the garden from a few different angles. So you can see on this particular picture, some of the some of the crevices, the stone is relatively flat. And you can see uh, like in the picture on the right, where we're uh, on the left side of that picture, where you can kind of see there's not a deep crevice. And then I have one where the stone sticks up more. And then you can see that bigger stone to the right where it, then it drops down. And that's kind of what you really want is to have these various heights because that's going to create the shadows it's going to create the microclimates it facilitates drainage so this is kind of what you're kind of shooting for and here's the garden with the first winter as i said i built it now two years ago uh so um and and i did it in like march of two years ago so i'm coming right up on two years so this was the first winter in the garden and again, there was some settling that was occurring. And so what I did, which is, of course, typical for a, a, a new garden, um, the sand will settle down a little bit. And so I did remove I did remove some of the top dressing. I did it after this picture. And then I put in some more sand and then put the top dressing back on. So I had to make a little bit of adjustments. And then here's the garden in its first actual spring so this will be a one year old then so it now got through the winter and the plants are waking up as i said most are spring bloomers and as as i mentioned this garden photographs in the winter i think it photographs best in the morning but the rest of the year i think it photographs best in the evening and this picture is in the evening so the sun uh, you know you can see that the as i mentioned the crevices um are kind of north south so the sun is now off to the west on the right side and putting the shadows on the garden and I, and it just looks great the rest of the year in the summer spring summer and fall uh it just looks great in the basically when i'm uh, taking pictures in the evening but that's the garden as it's waking up here's another picture so this is may uh, of this first full year in the garden and this is a picture now of the garden standing from the sidewalk so i mentioned that this is the now this is actually the view that people will see so you can see that even though it's sort of i did tell you that i i have the stones kind of north south it's not exactly it's at a slight it's at a bit of an angle i wanted the garden to be viewed from the sidewalk at an angle i didn't want people to see it head on because i thought it would be more interesting and my goal was ultimately to expand it to where some of those tulips are and then not replant the tulips and in fact that's kind of what i have ultimately done so here's just another picture and then here is where i'm going to expand it so the tulips were gone i wanted to move it into this little section so you can see the gold campanula on the on the left lower part of this picture um because when you see the expansion uh you'll see what i did so there's the campanula in its place uh and and there's a side by side picture and so i added some additional stone to expand the garden i wanted this base to kind of flare out a little bit and i went ahead and did that and um and i i was pretty pleased you can see that Again, you can see as you go down the berm that the stones kind of bury themselves down in. So you don't see any sharp edges as you get down lower to where the grass is. And that's going to be one of the important things to do. Here we are, June of 2023. So June of last year. So the, the expansion has taken place. I put a few succulents in. Uh, just in some containers that I just kind of stuck in the garden. I'm still letting some other plants kind of fill themselves in. But I can walk on these stones. Okay, so I can walk on the crevice garden. In fact, I can jump up and down on this crevice garden. So it's that's how tight this is. When when I built it, 
what you don't see is, and the reason you're burying the stones deep is that you can also get the stones then the lower edges of them to actually touch each other. And then sometimes I would take smaller stones like wedges and against the bigger stones, I would wedge them down so that those stones are completely underground, but they're wedged down to hold some of the bigger stones. But yeah, I can walk on any part of this garden and the stones don't wiggle or move or at all. So that's kind of where I'm, so this is the summer. So this is where we're at. And this is that view from the sidewalk. So you can see it from an angle. Uh, I made a decision. I added a little bit. I changed a few of the plants around that are near the, the crevice garden. I added a little scabiosa, which you can start to see because it was nice to have that basal foliage. And I really liked the airy flower stems kind of leaning up against the crevice garden. And I thought that kind of looked pretty good. Um, here it is in July. You can already start to see the woolly thyme, which is on the lower part of the picture and the crevice garden. Um, it definitely needs some pruning. And we'll talk about this with, with certain plants. It it became the, to me, the, the biggest garden thug on the crevice garden. Um, in this picture, I have, I like the pigmanthemum muticum that's in the back, but I think the height transition is too abrupt so i'm still going to have to play around with how this garden transitions in the rest of that bed so that's going to be my project for this coming year so now we're going to talk a little bit about some planting techniques and you know when to plant so you know for any of the the zone hardy plants yeah i think it's best to plant them in like middle to end of april before it gets hot we're going to talk about because you're going to bare root these plants so um, it really is good to plant them when it's still kind of cool. I generally recommend planting on, you know, cloudy days or early in the morning. And get the smallest plants you can. I try to have nothing bigger than a two, three and a half inch pot. Uh, some of them were two and a half inch. Uh, so get small ones. If you can only find a plant in like a gallon container, then I would recommend you you split up the plant and divide it and, and do smaller sections of it. What I did is I just let the soil dry a little bit and then removed as much as I could. I just shook it off. Then I soaked the roots and then I actually root washed everything. So I got off all the material. And the, again, the reason you want to do this and you want to bare root these plants is you want these plants, you want the roots to try to seek that soil at the bottom of the sand. So you're going to try to, you do not want organic matter up at the top. One, it'll be a place where other seeds and weeds can grow. You want to minimize the organic matter there. You want this to be a tough environment. You want to keep those crowns incredibly dry. And the best way to do it is to get off as much of that material as possible. And that will encourage the roots to dig down deep into the crevices. So here's just you know, me just doing a little bit of root washing so you can kind of see. And and what you find is that once you did that, and once I washed the roots and basically untangled them a little bit, most of the plant roots were going like six, seven inches deep uh, and even from these smaller containers. So it worked out really well. And then what you do is you just take out the top dressing, dig down into the sand, but do not, once you, if you reach, the soil, stop there, don't dig the soil up. Again, you don't wanna bring the soil into the sand. So you just go ahead and go down to the soil level, then just kind of dangle the plant in, let the roots kind of fit in there. I then went ahead and put some water in there and then I just started adding the sand back. I watered it again, put more sand in, watered it again, then put the top dressing in. I want the crown to be just at the top of the top dressing. Then I, I waited a couple hours, watered it one more time. And then what I did is I watered it daily for about one to two weeks. Now, if you do plant in like warmer times, so if you're planting and we get a warm spell in May or you do this in June or July, I would shade these plants for about seven to 10 days before. Um, it'll They'll just survive better uh, if, you've, if you'll shade them because of the bare root process. So that seems to work better. Now, maintenance. Absolute minimal, right? Um, water overhead, like I said, probably every two to three weeks the first year if needed. Um, you may not need to. I have not had to water except for that initial watering when I planted. 
I have not had to water this garden again. We've had a couple of dry spells. I know last year we had a six week period without rain. The garden was fine, didn't need any water at all. So no water needed, but definitely no drip, no misters. Uh, this garden needs to shed water. So you, if you're going to water it, you water it like rain. You need large droplets. So, you know, either a sprinkler or just a hose and just with that gives big droplets and just kind of do it. Only water in the summer. Most of these plants hate to be wet in the winter. And so you don't want to definitely add any water in the winter. And, and in fact, you may need to even think about row covers or cloches to reduce the rain falling on the garden in the winter months. And that's especially true with plants like Delisperma, the ice plant, or Armeria, thrift. So these are plants that definitely may need some additional protection. Now, you definitely want to remove any organic matter, so blow off any leaves. This is also why it's not great to have a crevice garden under a big tree, because you're going to constantly be blowing off leaves, because you don't want any of that leaf material to break down. You'll just introduce weeds. It'll give the weeds a, a, some, some place to be able to take hold. Um, if, we, if when you're trimming the plants, I'm a big fan of chop and drop. No material leaves my property, but on the crevice garden, I will cut. And then that I drop it somewhere else. I don't want organic matter building up on the garden. And then, you know, I have had only in the two years, I've had three dandelions get into the garden. That's it. Uh, no other weeds have been able to do it because of the stone top dressing and the sand. So nothing else gets in it. It's been really simple. Now, plant selection, you know, there is no way to go over a complete list of plants for crevice gardens. I mean, they're a unique environment with different microclimates within it based on how you construct it. And it's worth trying plants you've killed before, especially if the reason you killed them was because of root rot. The size of the garden is going to determine the plant selection, just if only to keep things in a good scale. So with those thoughts in mind, you know, I'm going to limit the plants that I highlight today with the following characteristics. Good chance of success, so I'm calling them beginner plants, relatively easy to find at nurseries that are small for their genus, that are perennial, that are, you know, good zone hardy plants and full sun. That's what I'm going to focus on. Now, I did create a handout at the last minute that has a list of all the plants that I'm going to talk and the cultivars that I mentioned today. Um, but you don't have it as part of the of what you you had access to now. So it will be included when you get the link to the recording, that handout will be included. So it'll have a list of everything I'm gonna talk about. All right, so we have to start with Campanula because that is what started the whole crevice garden movement. So I feel like it has to be concluded, you know, included. There's a ton of species here. A lot of them are really well suited to the crevice garden. They usually bloom June and July. Uh, here's one, the Serbian, um, camp, uh, the Serbian bellflower gets only eight to 10 inches tall. This one's easy to find. Blue waterfall is easy to, to get. It does tend to spread, so it will need a little cut back but it's, an, it's a good one. Uh, this one is a really small one. This is the one that you saw in my crevice garden. Actually, that picture is it. Uh, so this is Dixon's Gold. It's, it's the Adriatic Bellflower. Just gets three to six inches tall and is just gorgeous. It holds that beautiful color the whole year. So it looks great the rest of the year when it's not in bloom. And this one, um, Campanula waldsteiniana, is native to Yugoslavia. This also only gets three to six inches tall. Blooms in midsummer. Uh, I was able to get a few seeds of this, uh, so I don't have it current. I have the seeds. I don't have the plant currently. I only have a handful of seeds. I'm going to actually uh, get them planted up over the winter and then put the plants in in the spring. So I'm excited about that. Luisia, this was one of the things I always wanted to grow uh, outdoors. So, you know, it's, of course, the perennial jewel of the Pacific Northwest. It's super long blooming, uh, blooms in May and will rebloom in the summer, especially if you deadhead it. Uh, it can be evergreen or deciduous based on the species. Uh, I like I have the Luisia cotyledon. Um, sunset strain in my garden and also some of the hybrids they're all evergreen so you can get like little peach little raspberry and little plum those hybrids are also really easy to get a hold of oxalis adnophila is a is a really nice plant it's tiny it's only three to four inches tall it's native to chile and argentina blooms in late spring to early summer and has these really nice gray green leaves there are they are from 
forms and they this plant will go dormant in summer heat. And if you're looking for this, you would look at it from a bulb company. So like Brent and Becky's bulbs sell this one, for example, but any of the bulb companies, you can get this particular oxalis. Semper vivum, of course, fabulous plants, right? They're they're um, just wonderful. And you've got a gazillion different possibilities. Uh, so they're perfect for the crevice garden. They, they overwinter fabulously. As you all know, they're monocarpic. So once they flower, the mother plant will die. But of course, it'll have produced many offsets by that point. Uh, so these are easy and colorful and great additions. Uh, as far as time, I recommend kind of two groups. So uh, either, you know, Thymus uh, serpylum, Elfin only gets about two inches. So I would try to find out, get all Elfin. It's great for the crevice garden. It's fragrant. And then, you know, Woolly Thyme, which is only an inch tall, a uh, little minimal fragrance, but has those really nice hairy leaves. Uh, that's another really good one to put in. The only thing with Woolly Thyme, as you can see, it loves the crevice garden. So the you can see it in the winter on the left and uh, more of a summer picture on the right but it really spreads well that picture on the right that big old mass that was one plant so um it it has now gotten a significant cutback but you can see it can be a little overwhelming so I, that that's the little cautious about woolly time but i really loved it in the crevice garden uh armeria uh, just, you know, this is a great plant, um, but it is tough to overwinter for us. I have killed this plant so many times over the years and I was like, great crevice garden. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So, uh, the first year, yep, I killed them all. They didn't overwinter. Uh, so I'm trying one called Vesuvius. That's the one on the right. It's got this chocolate foliage with a deep pink, pink flower. And, um, that one is right now still alive. So I'm going to see, I may have to put some kind of row cover over it and just keep the winter wet out of it. So that's my next thing if this one doesn't make it this winter. Uh, but but there's, you know, you can get them in the, obviously the pinks, a um, little bit of a, a deep pink or the white, you know, Alba and little one are the white introductions. But this is a great plant um, to have if we can get it to overwinter. Ferns, you know, oh, this is a lot of times we forget about ferns in the full sun rock garden, but this is a great rock garden plant. So Myriopterus lanosa, the hairy lip fern, it gets like six to 12 inches tall. It's fuzzy. It has a black rachis. It does great in full sun. This is a native plant, by the way. It's one of our native um, ferns. It grows on the mountain edges, so it does full sun. Another fern to think about is a Splenium trichomonas. Um, and the maidenhair spleenwort, and that's a great one. It only gets four to eight inches tall, and they're both native to North America. So they're fabulous crevice garden plants. And I've got two of them in my crevice garden at the moment of this, and it, they're doing just great. Dianthus, of course, you know, tons and tons of species and cultivars, uh, most fragrant, probably the best for crevice gardens is Arenaceus, uh, which is also often called the hedgehog dianthus. Uh, you'll get that purple pink uh, fragrant flower in late spring, super compact. It stays really small. Subacolis is another good species. Uh, it's um, it, it's pink. It's a little bit looser, a little looser spread, but both only get like three to four inches tall. So they're really great uh, dianthus for the for the garden. Phlox subulata, uh, you know, easy to find, of course, native to our area, you know, tons of colors. We know it blooms in spring. Uh, it can overwhelm the crevice garden. That's the drawback. There is a cross between the eastern and the western one. And the one of the cultivars is called Cracker Jack. And that one's the cross. And that one stays a little bit more smaller and a little bit more contained. But it is a, a great plant. Aubrietta, the false rock crest. Um, I I like this plant. This is it's native to the rocky areas in Sicily, Greece, and Turkey. Gets only about six to nine inches tall. There it is in my crevice garden. Uh, flowers in mid to late spring. It looks like phlox, but it only has four petals instead of five, and that's one way you can tell it apart. Phlox is more heat tolerant though, but this plant is doing really well, even though we had a fairly hot summer last year. It held up really well, so it didn't have any trouble with the heat. Arabis, 
also looks like Aubrietta, but the difference is the flowers look the same with the four petals and they have that same look, but the foliage is bigger. So that's one of the differences between between Aubrietta and Arabis. About the same color, the same um, flowers, but the foliage is a little bigger on Arabis. There are some species that are native to the California coast. Um, Again, you get this really nice rosette of some fuzzy olive green leaves. And this one comes in kind of pink or white, typically. Saxifraga, uh, I would stick with the, uh, you know, if you're going to do it, I'd stick with the Arensia, uh hybrids. They seem to do the best. They're super low growing. They're very cold tolerant. And they, they work really great. You can get them in pink, red, or white colors in the in the if it gets really hot they do need a little bit more moisture but you know another great plant to have uh saponaria is also really nice uh especially sticking with the species osamoides this is native to eurasia blooms in june there's one called bressingham hybrid which is a great beginner cultivar it's easy to find just only gets three to four inches tall max Frey is another really nice small cultivar of this this is incredibly cold hardy down to like zone two so it's it's a really nice good plant to have in the crevice garden you can put cyclamen. This heterofolium is a really good one. And this would give you the autumn color if you're looking for it. It's uh, It only gets four to six inches tall. It does go dormant in summer. So then what it'll do is it'll pop up. The flowers come up in late summer and then the leaves which persist through the winter and into the spring. So uh, this is a great small little cyclamen for the crevice garden. Uh, you know, I mentioned before Della Sperma. You've got the tons of colors they're they're cool but again getting them getting them to overwinter so they don't rot in the winter so they do great i've struggled i still have not been able to overwinter this plant even in my crevice garden so this is another one that i'm probably going to have to put a row cover over or some kind of cloche in the winter and just keep this thing dry and that's what i'm going to end up trying next year sedums you know everybody can think about putting sedums in you know there's a lot of species available but a lot of them can be way too vigorous for a crevice garden however i would stick if with spathiofolium if you can get that species that you can get purpureum they get that little red color or cape blanco which has this which just looks like gray this whitish gray uh, they both have yellow flowers they're both tiny and they're not aggressive so i would hunt out spathiofolium if you want to put a sedum in the crevice garden I just had to include a cactus that's actually hardy for us. So Echinocerius, uh, the the one that's hardiest is this um, the Sandoval County form. Okay, so this is native to the to the um, southeast southwest U.S. Uh, but the Sandoval County form is cold hardy to zone five, and it only grows five to eight inches tall. So it's perfect for the crevice garden. Normal um, Echinocerius will grow about two feet tall, uh, but the the Sandoval Valley County form only gets is a lot smaller. So that that gives you that that year round. You can put a cactus in that will that you can keep out in the winter. So that's one worth looking up. Uh, Iris cristata, you know, another great plant to put in we often don't think about maybe putting these in there but they look great you can stick them in the crevices the key is they do need a little shade so they should be on the east side of a crevice or a boulder uh, but you can tuck it in there and they just look gorgeous and then um tulip atarda you know the species tulips but this one is is a perfect one to put in i i just put some of the bulbs in this last winter so i don't have a picture of it in my garden but this is it in my garden in a different spot so you can see it's up against it's next to that phlox divericata so you can see how tiny it is uh you know you get multiple blooms for from each bulb which is cool they only get like three inches tall so and they bloom kind of late april to early may so it's another really great crevice addition now, there is a ton of other plants, but I want to just highlight those to get you started. So those are the plants that we were going to talk about. And then kind of before I wrap up, 
you know, it's always good to have a reassessment time. So this was it blooming last year. So right one year after planting. And I just wanted you to see these plants and then I kind of label them so you'd be able to at least identify where they are. But remember, every one of these plants started the same size in one of those little pots. They all were the same size. So it was good to reassess. So the things that I noticed, which I mentioned, the Phlox subulata, the woolly thyme and the saponaria all clearly are overwhelming the crevices. Uh, I mean, those plants are definitely, um, you know, the the biggest. They're spreading over the tops of most of the rocks. They're they're spreading into the other plants. So I definitely need to think about that. Uh, so what I've done in the fall is I've severely cut these plants back, and I'm going to reassess this. And if it just doesn't work, I'm just going to try some different genera. Um, and and just see uh, and make some different arrange uh, different possibilities. But you can see you can see in the picture the Lewisia up above that looks awesome. The Arabis you can see in the upper left uh, just a really gorgeous in bloom. So some of these are really really pretty. But that that was just kind of my reassessment. And then I'm going to just finish with a couple more pictures of crevice gardens. So you can see you can do different things here in Denver. You can see how wide these crevices are, right? And they're interspersed with these kind of flatter, blockier rocks. You know, here's a different take at the high line, right? You can create little crevices uh, in in this in this way. And then containers work great. They look good in hypertufa. Uh, but just keep in mind when you make these containers, they're going to be heavy. So don't plan on moving them once you make it. But the nice thing, it's easy to take apart or change up the design. If you do it in a crevice, uh, I think it looks great when you have the, the peak off center. So that would be the advice I would have. And then this one, I just loved. I just felt like I saw this at a this was at uh, some garden center. Somebody had put this together, but it just looks like this was one boulder that broke apart. I just think they did great. Now, a really good question about containers people often ask then is, you know, what about the soil mixture? And honestly, what you basically just do is it's all sand with the exception of a handful of garden soil. And you do that just to put some micronutrients in there and just to put a little bit of initial life in there. So you just mix a handful of garden soil with coarse sand and then you just barely top dress it. You know, no more than maybe like a half an inch of top dressing um, on top. That's it. Uh, and make sure you have plenty, plenty of drainage holes in the container. So resources, yeah, you know, the rocks, uh, North American Rock Society is great. Paul and Kenton have wonderful YouTube videos that you can access for free if you want to see about constructing crevice gardens. Uh, they're going to be bigger crevice gardens, their YouTube videos. And then here's their book. And as far as I'm aware, that book is probably going to be available, I think, uh, at March into spring. And then, of course, hopefully you'll get Paul to be able to sign it when he comes in. Uh, online plants. Here's a couple resources. I've ordered from all of these resources, so uh, I can vouch for the quality of the plants that you would get, but they all have good alpines if you're looking for some of them. And then I'm just going to make a little pitch uh, for a minute here on my own home gardening series. So if you kind of like uh, kind of the way I, I present things. Um, I have my own series. Uh, these are the five offerings that I've got. They're all, you can basically see them all virtually on Zoom. And, and you do not have to be available, again, the day of the presentation, because anyone who registers will get a recording. Uh, but you're going to see, I'm going to start with the Four Season Garden in just about 10 days, which is really touring my own property and talking about how I created it as a Four Season Garden and what tips I have. Then I'm going to talk about ground covers and matrix plants. Uh, the 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 soil testing one is really about more about interpretation. By the end of this, you will know how to interpret and you'll be a soil science expert. It's a really science oriented uh, talk, but it, you'll learn so much that way. And then I then I come back in the fall with really plants for fall color and then kind of shade plants. So give it some thought. I'd love to have you anybody join in. And I thought this would be a great time for questions. Okay, yeah, we've been having questions and comments come in quite often throughout the program. Um, I'll, I've gone back to the beginning. We do have a Maria O'Malley. She has an old vertical stone wall on one side of her patio. 
and she's asking if she can put plants into the little spaces between the stones. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's that. I mean, that you can, a lot of people have their own pre-built crevice garden. So um, that that's the whole key. Um, just kind of dig your way in there. Do the same thing. Bare root these and get them in between the stones. As long as you have good drainage, that is the key. As long as that area isn't an area that's going to hold, you know, hang on to water, um, then that that's what you want to do. So that would be great. So Carol is asking if you have erosion issues on your uh, crevice garden. I don't have any at all. Um, the everything holds in place really well. My garden, my whole landscape is designed that I don't have water that rushes off anywhere. Um, that that ends up really being um, one thing that works out well for me. So I don't have anything in there. Uh, as I mentioned that that little garden where I built it, it kind of berms up and then down, and then I have plants all around it. So everything sucks up the water. I never see anything. Uh, nothing is moved. None of the stone actually has ever even like drifted into that little piece of grass in the front. So good to know. I think if you construct it well and the stone knits together, you're not going to have any trouble. Okay. So Ilona is asking, um, I know you mentioned the ferns, which are native. If there are any other native plants that might be suitable for crevice garden. Yeah, I mentioned a, a few in there, you know, that when I mentioned a few of the natives, um, honestly, that that there are some that the difficult thing with a lot of the native plants that I found is that it's hard to find species plants that will remain really small enough to fit in the crevices. So you're going to end up finding some kind of cultivars. So, you know, I mentioned, you know, I mean, obviously we've got, you know, I, I mentioned the Iris cristata is great. The, you know, Tulip Ataria, I mean, that one, that one's not native, but the, the cristata is great. The, you know, you can use the flocks, you can, but you've, you're going to have to have some cultivars that are sort of downsized. So it's hard to find some species that are small enough. I, I mentioned a few. The best way is to just kind of do a little bit of research and start looking at native plants and then try to find ones that remain really, really small. But you're going to find my experiences without going to cultivars. You're going to find that you're going to be doing a lot of maintenance because you're going to have to be cutting back these plants. Um, there, uh, let me, I'm just looking. Uh, so just a... Uh, we were reminded by Laura that you can print out the notes from this uh, presentation, but also remember we will be sending with the recording the plant list that Kevin has gone through with us. Um, a question from Tom is, have you had any experience with using very small ornamental grasses like nacella or wavy crinkle gra grass? I haven't. Um... I haven't. Uh, I'm. I'm. So I haven't. So I'm not sure. I haven't. I think some. I've seen some larger crevice gardens using grasses. Mine is too small um, to make the grass look appropriate. I. I would be concerned about any grasses that grow with rhizomes because mm -hmm. it'll be. It'll start to be very difficult. If you're going to do a grass, you would want to try it. It has to be a clumper. Right. Good point. All right, and then Tom's also recommending trying Lysimachia lanceolata, which is um, a native plant. It's a lance-leaved loose strife. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. good recommendation. And I, for those uh, that I mentioned that we have a ton of things on pop-ups, in April we are going to have a trough filling workshop. So if you want to test this out in a little space, the trough filling workshop would be ideal. So check the calendar be. for April. All right. Um, and finally, you're right, Kevin, we will be spelt selling the book that you highlighted at Good. the March into Spring. And I just want to let everybody know and remind everyone to go online and register. We're looking forward to the event. Um, we have no more questions. Uh, having said that, thank you so much. We've learned quite a lot. <laughs> Great, Nora. And thanks. And I want to thank everybody who, who joined in and participating. And I hope 
I hope I've inspired a few people to at least give it a try, even if, if it's just a, at least try a container or do the, go to the trough workshop. That'll be perfect. And then I hope to see I, I hope to see everybody live and uh, out at Winterthur. I think this will be <laughs> exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, someone just wrote in very inspiring. I know I while you've talked, I thought, OK, where could I put this? And I think right. I figured out a space. Thank you so very great. much, Kevin. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take Bye. care. Have a great day.